Head On Sanctuary, a look at the history and the future of the black church. Welcome to Sanctuary, bringing you conversation and stories at the intersection of life and faith. This edition of Sanctuary is produced in cooperation with the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago. Hello and welcome to this episode of Sanctuary. I'm Nissan Chavkin, Executive Director of the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago. February is Black History Month, and one of the great American institutions is the Black Church. The Black Church has been a foundation for generations of African Americans before and after the abolition of slavery in our country. It's also served as the driver of civil rights for African Americans and of social justice for people of all backgrounds. Today on Sanctuary, I've invited two guests to help us understand some of the history and achievements of the Black Church in our country and in Chicago, and talk with them about the challenges and potential of this remarkable institution for the future. With me today is Dr. Brad Braxton, president of the Chicago Theological Seminary here in Chicago and since 2011 the founding senior pastor of the Open Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Also with me is the Reverend Michael Eady, chairman of the General Council of Pastors and Elders of the Church of God in Christ and first administrative assistant for Bishop O.C. Booker, prelate of the First Jurisdiction Illinois of the Church of God in Christ and pastor of the People's Church of the Harvest Church of God in Christ here in Chicago. Gentlemen, Welcome to Sanctuary. So glad you're here today. Thank you so very much for the invitation. Our great pleasure. Great to be with you. Thank you. So I want to start by asking you to each tell us a little about um, yourselves and your institutions and if you can share with us uh, one of your earliest memories of what we might term the black church. Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> I'm Michael Weedy, um, pastor of People's Church of the Harvest, Church of God in Christ. Actually, um, I've been pastoring there for now 45 years at wow. the congregation. And uh, the very interesting thing is, it is a church that uh, I say they brought me into in the blanket. Our church has been <laughs> organized. Yeah. Uh, our church has been organized for 80 years. Mm -hmm. And um, as a small child. Uh, my parents were attending the church. I had no idea that the future would be what it has come to be. But I've uh, been there now for 45 years. Uh, we've been primarily located on the west side of the city of Chicago. And currently, we're in the East Garfield Park community mm -hmm. uh, at 3570 West Fifth Avenue. Um, and so my earliest uh, thoughts in terms of what the black church has represented for me uh, as a youngster. Uh, my, uh, the f organizer, founding pastor of our church, embraced me. Uh, I could not have been more than seven or eight years old. And he gave me a, um, a designation as a pulpit courier. Sounds very official. <laughs> yeah, and that was an official thing. and. Uh, and what my task was to run errands for him <laughs> from the pulpit to wherever it goes. And uh, he had given me a small seat on the platform. And, uh, and I tell you, that planted a seed of service mm -hmm. uh, into my spirit. And, uh, and so that, that was my earliest memory. Uh, and I'm sure you're probably aware of Church of God in Christ uh, we're international denomination, organized in 1897. Uh, we're headquartered out of Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, we're throughout the continental United States in 114 foreign countries. And our presiding bishop is uh, Bishop J. Drew Sheard out of Detroit, Michigan. Excellent. Brad? I am Brad Braxton, president and professor of public theology at Chicago Theological Seminary, a progressive graduate school in the Woodlawn neighborhood. Since 1855, wow. Chicago Theological Seminary has been educating courageous religious leaders and activists, educators to contribute to the increase of justice and mercy. I also am privileged to be the founding senior pastor of the Open Church of Maryland, an inclusive congregation committed to social activism and interfaith collaboration. And it is a delight to talk about 
the black church because it is for me an extended family. When I think about early memories of the black church, I think about my father who was a black Baptist pastor for more than 45 years. And there are stories, kind of the myths of our family of me sitting on the front pew of the First Baptist Church in Salem, Virginia, wow. where my father pastored for 33 years. And my feet were actually dangling in the air because my legs were not yet long enough to touch that red carpet. In that congregation that was founded in 1867, just two years wow. after the end of the Civil War, I invited often friends, particularly when I got into middle school and high school, to our congregation. And one of the things my friends would often say, when we come to the church where your daddy is the pastor, the pews hum. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, they were captivated by the musicality of the experience, mm -hmm. the energy of the worship, the warmth of the fellowship. Mm -hmm. So my earliest memories are of a community where there was such excellent artistry, mm -hmm. the eloquence of the preaching, and the exquisite musicianship made those pews hum. And my friend said, I'd like coming to your church because it's exciting. <laughs> That's where the pews hum. Got it. So you touched on a number of critical themes already. That's Even right. Early, we were talking about service and about the power and centrality of music, the power of eloquence in terms of from uh, the pastorate and just that sense of community and fellowship. Mm -hmm. Are these things that I'm trying to, for our viewers, to mm -hmm. understand how we might distinguish the black church from other churches? What does it have in common? What makes it distinct? How and uh, just please. And I really want to build on that as he was uh, speaking. That I, I have many people uh, when they want to come to our church or return to our church, they often reference uh, the experience, the worship environment, mm -hmm. uh, how they are often engaged, the warmth and that. And uh, I think that that is what makes the black church, in my opinion, uh, very unique in that it is real community mm -hmm. uh, in that regard, uh, where people come and uh, they are embraced, but also when they come, they can be built up, they can be edified, and that is important, uh, that they come into what I would like to believe and, and say is a safe space where they could come, be embraced, uh, their concerns can be addressed, uh, their needs can be met, and they can know that there is someone or a, a body of believers um, who are compassionate towards them. So. Uh, I think that that is vitally important. When I think about what is distinctive about the black church, the image that comes to my mind is that of an excavation project. There was a moment as our country is developing in the colonial part of our country's history and then as we become a country where Christianity was corrupted. I often refer to it as colonial Christianity a hegemonic, domineering form of Christianity that provided ideological, philosophical, religious justification for the subjugation of humans in transatlantic slavery. Mm -hmm. Part of this excavation project was then African Americans receiving this message and literally carving out of those racist elements of Christianity, carving that out and putting new content into it that actually moved Christianity closer to that message of Jesus of Nazareth. So in the creative mixture of African traditional religion and this excavation project that was going on with colonial Christianity, a new revolutionary way of thinking about Christianity emerged, one deeply rooted in freedom and dignity as a critique of a form of religion that was about subjugation mm -hmm. and oppression. And when you think about what the church has been able to do mm -hmm. um, in its history here, yeah. both uh, when it was underground, when it was nascent, when it uh, started to flower, and now, now today, when we look back on some of these, how has 
its ideology and this sense of community and purpose mm -hmm. and service from mm -hmm. pulpit runners all the way up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you see as some of its defining achievements? We've talked about one ideological or theological defining achievement of helping to forge a, an intriguing cut on or restore a cut on the teachings of Jesus. What else in, in a social sphere or in a religious sphere has it distinguished it? What are its achievements, if you were going to put it that way? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I have always associated to the black church is that faith as it is the foundational, has served as a catalyst for black achievement, mm -hmm. black accomplishments, etc. Uh, many of the uh, businesses and many of the great uh, institutions have emerged out of what has been given as a motivation from what the black church has inspired. Uh, we see and know of uh, insurance companies uh, great businesses that have been established, uh, um, many uh, political figures and personalities, uh, they all emerge and have foundation uh, coming out of the black church. So um, what I have recognized and certainly would like to raise up here is that faith as it is ingrained within the black church serves for the uh, promotion of black achievement and black accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to add that um, at their best moments, because mm -hmm. I don't want to romanticize mm -hmm. black churches, but at their best moments, there has also been a profound commitment to education oh, yeah. as a mechanism for social transformation. Mm -hmm. And I think as we are now moving into Black History Month, it's an opportunity for us to focus our attention on where our country was when our country literally fought itself to a place of great carnage over the question of the freedom of a subsection of its citizens. Mm -hmm. Shortly after the end of the Civil War and a combination of, of many religious people, many of whom were black Christian leaders, mm -hmm. along with uh, abolitionists and others, raised up a host of training institutes and the first right, centers that would later become our historically black colleges and universities. Right. Many right. of them have deep rootage in black religiosity more broadly and black Christianity. And in this moment, as an educator, where I see that education has become quite a theater of engagement mm -hmm. for ideology right now, <laughs> when people are trying to rewrite history we have to then say maybe one of the great roles of black churches in this moment, as after the Civil War, so too now, to provide the corrective to make sure that we understand the true history of our country so that we don't repeat its worst parts. Got it. And, uh, it sound, and you both seem to have a, uh, sort of touched on the, the internal power of the institution in shaping and supporting and sustaining the community. And I've also pointed out to some of these external vectors of how the church has been a force in the larger culture in a, in a uh, teaching and history of, of the country itself, mm -hmm. which is very exciting and uh, very powerful indeed. So uh, I think that gives us a, a sense of what um, might have been done and, um, and uh, it, it still seems to be as we look at the, the church uh, moving through, through time as it puts all of this energy coming out of different kinds of people moving through the church and then out into the world. Mm -hmm. It has been uh, quite intriguing to watch and, and the country is, is the better for it as we go in this interesting dynamic of both inside and outside for the communities. Mm -hmm. um, excellent, excellent. Um, in a moment we're going to uh, turn to some of what we might see as some of the, the puzzles and uh, uh, challenges and possibilities of the church, but uh, just as looking at the church today, uh, what what is um, where do we see it as a as a structure in our larger um, in, in in well here in Chicago and in the metropolitan area? Is it uh, where what could be one thing we point out and say, oh, that is the black church. Um, that's an expression of this particular experience. Mm -hmm. I would like to raise one that I think 
scholars and activists and educators would need to revisit. And uh, it is that fascinating notion that this city in particular and its connection to black Christianity, and I'm thinking here about, for example, the Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., who is mm -hmm. the most distinguished alumnus of Chicago <laughs> Theological Seminary. You are allowed to claim yes, him, absolutely. Indeed, <laughs> and we do so with great gratitude. And former President Barack Obama. Oh, yeah. Have significant anchorage in this city mm -hmm. in black Christianity. Got it. And the ways in which that way of thinking helped to fuel a democratic process. Mm -hmm. So to think not only about black churches as internal support mechanisms, mm -hmm. but as fierce centers of freedom that actually have tried to move the country closer to its democratic vision. Mm -hmm. Through the processes of Reverend Jackson's historic runs for the presidency, which of course made possible what would later happen mm -hmm. with former President Obama, we moved closer. People were encouraged to vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Voting wasn't made harder, it was made easier. It was faith, as I like to say, that sweated. Faith that had a job, and the job was, let's enlarge the democratic vision. Mm -hmm. let's, let's not make it smaller. Mm -hmm. So I think right here in this city, there are some profound examples of a faith that works and works not only for its internal members, mm -hmm. but works to make the country and the world better, more loving, more just. Faith in service, as it were, to pick up mm -hmm. on what Pastor Eddie was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Intriguing. Ben Pastor, anything you wish to yeah, add? Yeah, I, I want to speak big, for the West Side now because we've had all this yeah, yeah, stuff I about know, the no, South Side. Yeah, we, and we've already had that discussion <laughs> as well. But I want to build on the fact of, of what he was dealing with with Jesse Jackson and Obama. One of the things that the black church certainly has been a major promoter of is voter education mm -hmm. and voter mobilization, okay, and then voter registration. And so those are the things that uh, the church has certainly directed and, and uh, educated its congregants to know that this is how many things that impact us are going to be changed, uh, whether it's in the area of criminal justice, whether it's in the matter of health disparities, whether it's about uh, community disinvestment, whatever, that if we can take the right actions and uh, make the right uh, decisions, we can lend to the directions of our own communities. So that is so vitally important. Excellent. Well, we're going to take a break here right now, and in a moment we'll return and discuss uh, some of the exciting challenges and potentials of the black church for the future. We'll be right back. Metropolitan Chicago is one of the most religiously diverse areas in the world, and for more than a half century, Sanctuary has reported and reflected on our faith-filled community. Sanctuary tells stories of faith from both inside our houses of worship to the streets and neighborhoods where faith is acted out every day with acts of kindness and concern. From food pantries to peace initiatives, from worship services to servicing the poor, Sanctuary has a proud history of reporting on the goodness that flows from our faith traditions. Watch Sanctuary every Sunday at 12 noon. Welcome back to our conversation about the black church here in Chicago and across the country. My guests today are Dr. Brad Braxton of the Chicago Theological Seminary, Pastor Michael Edia of the People's Church of the Harvest, Church of God in Christ here in Chicago as well. And gentlemen, our conversation now, just as we have this segment, is to think about the future and to yes. think about where the church is going, uh, things that you anticipate or and see now as challenges, mm -hmm. um, and where do you see is its potential? What's its next great chapter going to be? Uh, why don't we start with you, Brad? I'd be delighted to share what wonderful questions. I am a proud, child of black churches, but I also, as part of that pride, must take a critical look at 
this moment, um, many black churches are struggling with um, several real challenges, uh, to name just a few. Many have not embraced as fully as they might um, a robust engagement with these kinds of social issues, that there is a through line for many churches, but sometimes we have um, fumbled the ball and left that prophetic mantle. The second thing that I would say um, that really calls for serious engagement is um, the historical abuses in black churches as it relates to sexism and patriarchy and heterosexism, that this is a real moment for black churches to realize that having come through great tribulation and great oppression, it is an anathema before the divine to then inflict that kind of oppression on others right within our midst. So I think this is an opportunity to do some serious soul searching. And then finally, a place of great engagement for me as the president of Chicago Theological Seminary and the pastor of the Open Church. I think black churches have an opportunity to really engage the interreligious theater, to realize that in this increasingly secular moment, we must make the case afresh for why people would want to pay attention to us. We no longer can assume a certain centrality to the culture. It's an opportunity to say that we have a vision that can be offered to make the world better. And also we need to assume a posture of humility and curiosity and learn from other religious and ethical traditions and not simply wag our fingers and try to evangelize, but maybe be open ourselves to being converted. Well, one of the things that uh, certainly as I, in my role as uh, chairman of Pastors and Elders of the Church of God in Christ is we are directing pastors uh, that they must be able to engage uh, the community, the broader community, mm -hmm. differently. Uh, many of us have been more inclined to just an in-person uh, kind of engagement of those that we are reaching out to. Uh, but one of the things that we're raising up more is that we have to be able, through greater technology, we're going to have to uh, engage individuals right through the tablets, right through their phones, right through the laptops, because that's where many people are living. And, and then when we do engage them, we have to have that prophetic voice uh, and give them direction as to what the mind of the Lord is uh, for each and every one of them. We're pastors, and we can never divorce ourselves of of that primary responsibility. And so that's what we are sharing with uh, the pastors within our faith community, that it is vitally important for them to engage through technology to a greater degree. Right, this challenge of technology coming forward and, and having a, a critical look for ourselves. Now, as I think it was uh, Dr. Christer Stendhal used to say, you know, we, we should never measure ourselves by our best and their worst, or vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. We have that critical gaze has to be fair. And those questions are indeed things that many people are uh, of all faiths are um, wrestling with, is the question of technology and uh, spreading the further vision uh, as they see it. And being opening to listening to everyone in our increasingly diverse world. Is there one example of a project uh, that you're engaged in that is helping you fulfill what you uh, see as one of those great opportunities for the future. Pastor Edie, is there a giant tech initiative we should be watching for from the Church of God in Christ, a commercial during the Super Bowl, something? Uh, yeah, no, not, not, not okay. quite in, okay. in that regard. But yes, uh, the Church of God in Christ definitely is moving. They have uh, established a, a full technology branch ah. uh, for the, the church. And what we're doing is in engaging pastors uh, even through a conference that I give direct leadership to. We have tracks where they are being introduced to technology, et cetera. Uh, we are sponsoring many of our pastors to go to various uh, conferences. One in particular was a Church and Technology Summit uh, that was just recently convened in Nashville, Tennessee, to expose them to how to engage uh, communities even beyond just where they are immediately, 
uh, through those means of technology. So it's just a matter of arming them with the resources that they need. Thank you. All right. There is an example that readily comes to mind. Right as the pandemic uh, was raging in July of 2020 at the Open Church of Maryland, where I serve as founding senior pastor, we began to develop an initiative that we now call Sundays with Sacred Siblings, mm. where we intentionally invited to our Zoom pulpit someone who was not Christian. Mm -hmm. On that particular, particular day, my dear friend and uh, scholarly colleague, Dr. Anthony Penn, who is a professor of religion at Rice University, came to the Open Church. And I'd like to say, Nissan, you haven't seen church on a Sunday morning <laughs> until you have one of the world's most uh, erudite, black, secular humanist giving an address to a Zoom sanctuary of 80-year-old hat-wearing church mothers. It was <laughs> just the most m marvelous and explosive in the right kind of way mm -hmm. moment because we, as a Christian community realized that we were being edified by someone who doesn't even believe in God. Mm. It flipped the script. Mm -hmm. As a result of that process, Dr. Penn and I recognized that we were not done. And through the seven months or so after that, uh, during the pandemic, we used email to write a book together. Huh. And we wrote a book entitled A Master Class on Being Human. Mm. A black Christian and a black secular humanist on religion, race, and justice. Wow. Mm -hmm. I have learned more about God and the sacred and a vision for a better world by hanging out with a brother beloved who does not believe in God. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I have learned in preaching and listening to sermons for decades. Wow. wow. Well, there's a note to end on. <laughs> yes, it is. I want to thank you very much, each of you, uh, for your time and your insights and your wisdom today. Uh, my thanks go specifically to Dr. Brad Braxton, of, uh, president of the Chicago Theological Seminary here in Chicago, Pastor Michael Eady, uh, pastor of now for 45 years of the uh, People's Church of the Harvest, Church of God in Christ, also here in Chicago. And our thanks as well to all of you who are watching this episode of, thank of Sanctuary. And until next time, we urge you to enjoy Black History Month and accept our good wishes for good health and peace. Metropolitan Chicago is one of the most religiously diverse areas in the world, and for more than a half century, Sanctuary has reported and reflected on our faith-filled community. Sanctuary tells stories of faith from both inside our houses of worship to the streets and neighborhoods where faith is acted out every day with acts of kindness and concern. From food pantries to peace initiatives, from worship services to servicing the poor, Sanctuary has a proud history of reporting on the goodness that flows from our faith traditions. Watch Sanctuary every Sunday at 12 noon 